Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio in Glen Rock, New Jersey. If you're a fan of the channel, uh, you know that I have one of the coolest jobs in the audiophile world. I get to experience all sorts of equipment almost on a daily basis. Well, this is uh, an acquisition we've just made and it is incredibly timely. Uh, Macintosh, uh, one of our favorite brands, as you know, uh, just released the MC3500 MK2, which is a, a reissue of a famous amplifier uh, a monoblock amplifier, as a matter of fact. And in front of me, I've got exactly that. I've got a pair of MC3500 original vintage amplifiers, all tube, in their full glory. And I consider these to be almost a, a barn find. And, and really the condition on them and, uh, and the patina, you'll, you'll see what I mean about a barn find. If you're a car collector, uh, you know exactly what I am referring to. And these are just that. Now, the 3500 is known, or it's, it's most famous because of its uh, sort of affiliation with Woodstock, the concert in 1969. Um, it powered Woodstock. It was said that these were the, the model, not the exact amplifier. Even though there were very few of them made, uh, we ha we're making no claim that these had any relationship to that. But it's the model that sort of powered the Woodstock concert. And that's why it's sort of coveted and, and considered one of the most desirable pieces of audiophile gear. So I thought I'd take a moment today and show you these amplifiers, talk a bit about their specifications, their history, what makes them so cool, so collectible. We'll take a dive inside as well and, and talk about their history. So um, if, you, if you like the channels, please, this would be a great chance to uh, subscribe and like our videos uh, so that we stay motivated. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. So the MC3500 is a monoblock amplifier, which means that to drive a stereo system, obviously we need two of them. And that's why you see only one meter per side. Um, in typical fashion of 1960s Macintosh uh, look, uh, it's a dual metal finish. We've got a brushed, a really cool sort of uh, champagne brushed finish on the faceplate, aluminum and a painted lower section. This is consistent with other amplifiers of this generation, the MC. 2500 to 2300, which we've featured before. So um, typical Macintosh look. Now this came in two variants, um, the consumer version and the uh, commercial version or industrial. The MI350 would have been its, its brother. Now consumers is a lightly used term. Um, very few consumers in 1968 needed a 350 watt tube amplifier. There were speakers back then were just not that hungry. So it was really, really meant for an extreme audiophile or an extreme situation um, that you would actually call for a pair of these amplifiers for the home. Um, I think they were probably more designed for commercial and industrial use than they were for residential use. But of course, you know, it's Macintosh having such a huge residential fan base that they made these available as a, a consumer model. So it was designed by Miles Nestrovic in 1968, and it's often been referred to as the greatest tube amplifier ever made. Um, not just because it powered uh, Woodstock, but because of its sort of design and capabilities in both current and voltage. Um, it was manufactured for a very small period of time. It was really only from 1968 to about 1971. And the retail price on this back then was a thousand and change. So let me see exactly, I've found an actual price list here from 1970, and sure enough, we've got here an MC3500, 350 watt power amplifier, 135 pounds at $1,099 each. So this would have been about a $2,200 investment in 1970 if you wanted to use these for your home. Other cool things on here, I'm just looking at the price sheet for the first time. MC50 is listed here, the MC250, the 2105, which I believe I also saw a slight variation of that in one of the photos from Woodstock. Pre-amplifiers back then, they were focused on them making the C24 and the 26 and the 28, 28 being one of our favorite preamps from this era. Um, here they've got listings for the MI3, the maximum performance indicator, that's pretty cool, at $249. MR77 was $649, holy cow. That's quite a bit of money for uh, a tuner. I didn't realize it was so expensive. Anyway, I'll go back to this price list. I don't want to deviate too much. Back to the MC3500s. Uh, 
So um, let's see some of the interesting facts about this amplifier, at least design intent. Um, and they really mention it here uh, in typical Macintosh fashion. Up in the top plate, they kind of um, spe you know give us a sort of flowchart of of its technology. So here we see uh, markings for 350 watts from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which is pretty neat for back then. A lot of amplifiers, especially concert going amplifiers, were limited on, on the lower side of the bandwidth. Um, but this had a full, full range, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. 1.1 uh, volt RMS input level, uh, which is uh, means that at, at 1.1 volts inputs, this will be putting out 350 watts, which is pretty neat. Um, and there are facilities you'll see later that lets you tame that down a bit. A distortion is claimed at 0.15% harmonic or intermodulated. Um, signal to noise ratio uh, greater than 95 dBs and then consumption on there. So from left to right we see our input signals here following gain controls, cathode followers, then the differential amplifiers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We move on to the Unity coupled output stage. These are the eight um, tubes that power this amplifier. And then the pentafiller output transformer. This is one of the things in the brochure they claim to be a sort of new technology or at least a, a new innovation for this amplifier. It's, uh, it really talks about the number of windings in the output transformer. And as you know, if you're familiar with Macintosh, it's all about the output transformers. Um, so here is um, a mention of the pentafiller output transformer and uh, some breakouts here for the meter range and all the way to the outputs. Um, one of the things you'll notice right away that's different from most amplifiers from this era is that there is this just a single set of taps for the outputs. Uh, on the back, we'll see that right there, there's a single output here, which is atypical for amplifiers from Mac that usually be, you know, two, four, eight ohm taps selectable. But in this amplifier, they gave you the convenience of selecting from the front. I imagine this speaks to its commercial intent. So from left to right on, on the faceplate, we've got unusual again, mostly because it is a commercial amplifier. We've got inputs and outputs in the front of the amplifier. This was uh, probably to be able to test things and make up of, you know, changes on the fly in the middle of a concert or as you're setting up for a concert. So we've got RCA jacks for both uh, I'm sorry, we have both RCA and uh, BNC style laboratory connections for the input. We've got gain rated from 1 to 10 here. Okay, and then we've got the meter range. This is a multifunction knob here. Um, you'll see that the meter is colored. It's got three segments. It's got a, a blue, black, and green. And these colors correspond to the colors on the faceplate, which is interesting. So we've got uh, the ability to control what the meter does in the front from being off. Uh, these eight positions are for setting the bias on the, on the tubes themselves. Uh, there's a volt setting for measuring the output voltage. And then these two settings are for having, uh, measuring the output wattage uh, in both uh, 0 and minus 10 dB. So this is sensitivity for the meter. So for example, this would correspond with the black section here. In the front, we've got a massive <laughs> industrial uh, circuit breaker. And then the output range, which I mentioned before, is the ability to choose the output impedance. Um, and there's a reference for it both in volts and ohms, again, corresponding to the voltage meter here. And then a set of outputs here, probably for monitoring. I doubt you'd connect them to your speakers this way. Uh, another notable thing is its rack mount ability. Uh, you can see the the holes on the side of the faceplate. And then um, typical of, of amplifiers from this era has a really neat chassis design. I love this chassis design. I wish uh, Macintosh um, continued with his ability to stack amplifiers. They've got these really neat rails here, aluminum bent rails that allow you to kind of locate one amplifier on top of the other. So the feet line up just perfectly on top of each other. Now I know Mac doesn't want us to stack amplifiers nowadays back like what they did back here, but Sometimes it's inevitable they're going to get stacked, whether it's for transportation, just moving them across the room, or whatever it may be. I love this design uh, for the chassis. So this is removable, and you can't put these in a cabinet, as you'll see in some of the pictures from Woodstock. 
but for the residential version, we look for these side rails. Let me see if I can flip this around and show you the, the back. Moving around about 250 pounds of amplifiers. So, from left to right, we've got a conventional grounded AC input plug um, and ratings for 117 and 25 volts. And that was selectable right here. Um, so, you can match that uh, captive fuse, I'm sorry, removable fuse, and then the output terminal for speakers as well. And then the same input terminals that we saw in the front, both uh, RCA, VNC, and the subsonic filter. I believe I have the specs on that. That subsonic filter, let me see, I think that takes down, yeah, here it is. The switching back uh, power soft or, or rolls off the response 60 dB per octave below five Hertz. So it's really just a subsonic filter to kind of keep things in check. Um, moving on to this tag here, uh, the serial numbers ranged, I think, started at 10 and went beyond that. This particular set is not a sequential set. And I suspect what would happen back then is that um, not that often these were sold in Paris. I imagine that these were, were quite frequently sold as single sets, and then eventually as they became more and more collectible, people try to put together a pair. So it's not uncommon. I've looked online that a lot of the offerings from this series is uh, they actually don't have matching serial numbers or even in the neighborhood. Uh, there's also a fan here. I'm not quite sure if it's variable, but there's a fan here to keep things cool. And I think that's it. Next, I'm going to crack the top open and show you some of the internals. Hang on a second. Okay, I've removed the top, and now we're going to take a, a bit of a look inside. Um, the first and most notable uh, item is this uh, audio transformer um, sitting here. It's the largest uh, transformer in the system, uh, followed by the uh, power transformer here uh, for the primary and the secondary power transformer. Um, over here, we can see the, the output tubes. These are the six LQ6s uh, that are configured for the output stage. Um, additionally, there are some tubes over here and those are fairly conventional. I've got the spec sheet right here. We've got um, 12, uh, two, I'm sorry, two 12 AX7s. We've got um, a pair of six DJ8s, a uh, single 6CG7, a 6BL7, and then there's a reference about the, the rectifier that is in fact a solid stage, solid state uh, full wave bridge rectifier. So fairly simple in design. We see some, some capacitor banks there, probably multi type capacitors, and um, the fan in the back kind of blowing or, or moving air current through the tubes themselves. I see that there are some slots on the side of the chassis, so the airflow would have been uh, in from the sides and then out the back uh, for the heated air to cool all the internals. Now it's a, it's a dual sort of layer design where to get a look at the circuitry, you've got to flip the unit upside down and then you'll see some of the PC boards and some of the point to point wiring. Um, so that is kind of part of the reason, the sort of design language of having uh, a sort of a dual level face plate and this line here probably allows air for the lower section. So these are not in great shape. There are, um, they, sh they do show some, some rust and some wear over the years, not uncommon for amplifiers of this generation that have had a good usable life. Uh, these have been loved and used and enjoyed for, for probably a very long time. Now we put these on our bench and they actually work. They work uh, not too poorly. They actually put a signal through, they're ampl <laughs> they amplify the signal. Uh, they need some love and care, some attention to some of the uh, potentiometers, selectors, etc. But they're not that far from being uh, a working set um, I know the jacks in the front are all rusted, it'll probably need to be replaced. So we're sort of toying with the different options here. One is to do a full-blown cosmetic again, functional restoration, and the other is to just work on getting them, uh, just you know, getting them working beautifully uh, and keeping the sort of vintage rough look. Um, the, the one thing that does let them down is that the handles don't match. We've got a, 
a gold set on one unit and a black set on the other. And we'll probably address that so at least cosmetically they look like they belong together. So again, they're not that far from, from getting some great performance out of them. Um, a bit more about Woodstock. So um, there are plenty of pictures and, and documentation out there. I think CE Pro did a cool article on uh, the technology used for it. And with the launch of the MK2 version, there's been a lot of talk and meetings and, and kind of reviving the, the ideas behind it. So um, I think 17 of these units were used in Woodstock, uh, totaling about 10,000 watts at 8 ohms. Uh, there were 16 loudspeaker arrays, uh, mostly using JBL D140 uh, 15-inch woofers. So get an idea of the size of, uh, of the venue. Now, by today's standards, that's not a lot of watts and that's not a lot of speakers. But back then, it was quite a, quite a bit. Uh, on the high ends, mostly Altec horns. So these were really Altec speakers powered by Macintosh gear. All right, and uh, I saw another note somewhere that about 2,000 amps of current were needed, or of electrical current were needed to, to run the whole rig. Um, so that uh, wraps up this phase. Then I'm going to go to the computer and show you a few sort of pictures from, from the his historical side. Okay, I'm on my computer looking to share some of the images I found that were interesting. So here is a first of showing three of the racks uh, and about eight of the MC3500s. You can see them in pairs. Um, this uh, equipment was uh, assembled by Hanley Sound. Uh, they were the company, the commercial uh, company in charge with, um, or charged with doing the sound reinforcement for Woodstock. And here you can see all the amplifiers in the racks, including some of the ones above the uh, residential models. Uh, here's a great picture as well. Uh, this uh, shows a few interesting things. The XLR jacks here were retrofitted into the front panels. Um, obviously, XLR uh, cables are more commonly used in pro audio equipment, so it looks like these M3500s were modified for it. Um, so you see three or four racks. Interesting, this one here, the amplifier is kind of half sticking out of the rack. Probably had to service some tubes and, and do a quick swap. Uh, but the mess of wiring and stuff is it's really always impressive. Um, and look at this. This is uh, a great uh, archival picture of some of the wiring uh, from the actual concert. Pretty crazy. Um, this is, in fact, the reissue, the MK2 version that I was referring to. Macintosh did an absolutely beautiful job uh, with the cosmetics on this unit. Um, you can see the exact same in the design language, right? The, the half of the two colors between the, in the faceplate, the industrial handles, and uh, I'm happy to see that they recycled the same uh, structure that I pointed out before, this sort of aluminum rail that uh, goes around the back of the unit that allows you to stack them just brilliantly. So a real, real faithful representation. Obviously, they went with a big, large meter like their current uh, production units. It's still 350 watts of all tube power. They obviously use a different tube, uh, but um, I'm sure a lot of it is in the same vein. Uh, here's a rear panel shot of the connections, and uh, notice the feet are also on the back of the unit so you could stand it up during transport. So this foot in the bottom kind of wraps around, and this one sits up top to let you sort of sit the unit up on its back end if you needed to. And to make sure that you don't destroy anything, they mounted the binding posts facing up uh, and slightly set into the unit. Instead of a fan, I'm pleased to see that they used a um, just a convention cooling uh, using a perforated top. That's great. And we don't like noisy fans and, and equipment. And here it is. Absolutely beautiful. Now, if um, if you want to get one of these beauties, you know, get a, get, you know, you're our, in our local area, get a hold of our partners at Stair Exchange. Uh, they've got probably the first set to be shipped or one of the first sets. Uh, you can visit them at stereoexchange.com. There's a picture of Ann and, and Dave. But um, again, you've got to be in the local area. They, these can't be shipped out of market. So if you are in the tri-state area and you want to visit Stereo Exchange, give them a, a holler. And I'm sure you can listen to the just arrived MC3500s. So that's about it. Thanks for watching. Um, I'd love your comments on these videos. Um, I'm sure I've made at least a dozen or two mistakes in the process. I'd love to hear from you what they are. Uh, and, you know, it keeps kind of the community 
engaged and interested. So also be sure to visit us at skyfiaudio.com if you want to see any of this gear. So the 3500s, they're not going to be up for sale for a while. We're going to take our time and get them back to tip-top shape. Uh, but there's hundreds, probably six, 700 items uh, listed in our website. Here's some MC2Ks, some Monster 2001 amplifiers. Uh, here's some more of the stuff on Bay 3 and our, our own little wall of uh, Macintosh sound here. So, oh, and look at this. Uh, I mentioned that uh, MC2500, we've got a beautiful specimen right here. Uh, this would have been found more at the Grateful Dead uh, wall of sound, but it's still a really neat piece of history. So um, visit us online and uh, make sure you comment on our videos and, uh, and subscribe, of course. Thanks for watching.